All right. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Norrell. I am the business uh, liaison librarian here at UT Tyler. I'm also the instruction coordinator. My pronouns are she and her. Um, if I've never met you, I'm so glad to see you today. And if we do know one another, then you know um, I'm very laid back in my workshops. So I just want to invite anybody who has a question or, you know, um, maybe would like me to repeat something, you know, throughout the workshop, please feel free to, you know, drop it into the chat, raise your hand on Zoom, or just speak up, unmute yourself and speak up. I'm uh, always open. Um, and uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, tools and services to improve or make your literature review more efficient, time-saving tips, things like that. Um, I was just saying earlier, I don't profess to be any sort of uh, expert on literature reviews. I've done a few. Um, and the thing that I always take away is they take a while. And there's good reason for that. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have to be painfully long. And so let's look today at some uh, library services and tools that can really help you get through those literature reviews. Um, as quickly and efficiently as possible. So I'm going to be sharing my screen. Okay. Um, and so I just want to do a double check. Everybody can hear me really well and can see my screen. It's on Google Scholar right now. Perfect. I'm getting some nods. Thank you so much. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do, I know that I had mentioned library services to improve, and it may seem odd that we're starting on Google Scholar's website. Um, first of all, I know we all use Google Scholar very, very often. Um, students usually are so surprised whenever I tell them, you know, always do your searching in library databases, but also it doesn't hurt to replicate those searches in Google Scholar. Um, you know, I'm a big believer, if you've got a tool, use it to your advantage. Just know how it works, right? Don't rely only or explicitly on Google Scholar, you know, and things like that. But I'm also a big believer in, you know, if you're gonna Google, Google smarter, not harder, right? And so, the one thing that I always recommend is that if you are using Google Scholar, make sure you have your account linked to the library resources. So some of you may already be familiar with this. If so, great. Um, if you're not, when you have Google Scholar open, go over here to this little, the menu bar, um, you know, it's just the little three flat lateral lines. Click on that. Um, and we're going to be going to settings. Now, I do just want to point out there is an advanced search option for Google Scholar, and I highly recommend that you take advantage of that as well. Um, in the library, we're always recommending using advanced search anytime you have that option um, because it saves you time in your searching. And of course, that's going to make your searching more efficient from the start. Um, so hopefully fewer headaches. Um, but like I said, we're going to go to settings here. We'll click on settings. And then we're given another menu here on the left. And so in that menu, I'm going to go to library links. So when I click on that, we're given essentially a search box. And then you'll see if you've not linked the library resources to your Google Scholar account, you will only see Open WorldCat, which is great. You want to keep that checked. Um, you can see I already have mine linked here. Now, what you should do is simply type in the University of Texas at Tyler. Okay, so I hit enter. Now, if you've just done this for the first time, you'll be seeing all three of these options with Open WorldCat already clicked. We want to leave that. Um, and then you'll be have, uh, excuse me, then you'll have these other two options. So you'll have University of Texas at Tyler, UT Tyler Access, and you'll have University of Texas Health Science Center at Tyler, full text, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I am going to click the top one because that's the one that is associated with the, um, the main campus, if you will, or the Robert R. Muntz Library. That's an easier way to look at it. Um, the Health Science Center, I don't work at the Health Science Center, but if you do, or if most of your research comes out of the Health Science Center um, or with those faculty, then I would click on that bottom option. Either way, you should only have one clicked. Um, and with the merger, 
it gets a little fuzzy. Uh, I could give an explanation as to why we have to choose one or the other, and that may change in the future with the merger. But for right now, for today, we'll just stick with, click on the one that you're associated with. So I have UT Tyler um, access selected, and I'm just gonna click save. And then once you do that, it just takes you back to the homepage of Google Scholar. So I can do, um, I can do one of my standard searches here, um, which is almost always, uh, you know, something to do with leadership, right? Um, let's take leadership in women. And so we see our standard search results here in Google Scholar, whatever your search may be. Um, but you'll notice over here in the right-hand column, when you're looking at you know, how to access those resources, you'll see that some of them have UT Tyler access um, underneath them. And that means that the Robert R. Muntz Library has full text access to that resource. And you can actually click on that link and follow it to the UT Tyler Robert R. Muntz Library access. Um, so like I was saying, it's just one way to be really efficient with your searching, right? You don't have to do all the guesswork into, oh, I found this resource. Well, I can't access it on the web. Let me check on the library's website. It saves you a lot of time of, you know, the constant clicking and typing and copying and pasting. And, you know, we either have it or we don't. And Google Scholar will actually show you that. So quick thing just to get us started and kicked off. Does anybody have a question about Google Scholar and linking the library access before we move on? Okay. Just want to take a minute. Some people might be typing. All right. I'm not seeing anything come through the chat. Um, if you think of something and you want to, you know, speak out and say it or drop them in the chat, please feel free but we're going to move on for now. So I'm gonna close out of uh, that tab. Um, the two main uh, products that I'm gonna be talking to you today about, one of them is actually a, a citation manager um, or a reference manager. Um, and so that is called SciWheel. Um, and that is one that the library does subscribe to. And you may use a different um, citation manager, and that's fantastic. I'm not trying to tell you that one is better than the other. Use the one that you're comfortable with, because I'm sure that we all know by now, the citation manager or reference manager will really make your life a lot simpler when it comes to that literature review and, you know, maintaining the literature, keeping it in order, keeping your notes in order, you know, things like that. Um, SciWheel is just the one that I prefer because it's so well integrated into um, the web browser and into Microsoft Word, um, and there's collaboration abilities to it. And so that's the one that I prefer. And since the library subscribes to it, I'm going to show it to you today. The other thing that we're going to focus on today is a database called Scopus. Many of you have probably already heard about Scopus or may use it. Um, I am going to go over it today and just kind of talk about um, maybe some different ways to use Scopus that you haven't necessarily thought about or haven't thought about, um, you know, some of those key features that really make Scopus, um, you know, the great powerful tool that it is. Now, I do want to take a moment here and just say the resources that um, we're going to be going over today are going to be based out of Robert R. Muntz's library, um, library access. The uh, Watson Wise Library, um, instead of Scopus, I recommend that you replicate all the things that I go over to, in Scopus today in the database Web of Science, okay? Um, usually I teach those in tandem, right? Because they work so similarly um, that it just makes sense to search both. However, uh, Months Library has Scopus and Watson Wise Library has Web of Science. So either way, you have a fantastic resource available to you. It works very similar. They work very similarly, and they're going to be very valuable in your uh, literature review process. Um, and I did just want to point out uh, on the Watson Wise Library page, um, it's under the resources link or page. And if we scroll down, we see web of science right here, okay? 
I could click on it, but I'm not going to have access because I don't have those uh, uh, Health Science Center uh, credentials to log in. But I just want to make sure everybody knew where it was. Okay. And so when we're talking about SciWheel for Scopus on the month's library page, you want to follow the database by title link. Now, for anybody who's unfamiliar on how to get to the library's homepage, it's uttyler.edu forward slash library. Um, or I know a lot of people just Google UT Tyler Library. Either way, all, all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> um, so from here, I'm going to go ahead and click on that databases by title, and it opens up in a new tab. Now, a lot of people get here and then they kind of freeze. They get a little intimidated or overwhelmed because it is an alphabetized list of all the databases we subscribe to. That's over 250 databases. And I know that that's quite a lot. Usually students at the point, this point are just like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, um, We know exactly what we're looking for. So we're gonna go ahead and just use this alphabet right up here at the top. And since both of our databases or resources today start with the letter S, I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And so here we just have an alphabetized list under the letter S. Right, so we're going to scroll down until we see SciWheel, which is right here. Um, now, for those of you who have been at the university for a while, you may have heard it by its former name, which is F1000 or F1000 Workspace. Um, that was a few iterations ago. Uh, it's now owned by a new company, but it works exactly the same. So I'm going to go ahead and click on SciWheel. And then for me, because I'm logged into my account, it already opens up for me. Um, I'm gonna hit back because I just wanted to show you guys how that works. If you're off campus um, or if you're working in your office or maybe you've never used SciWheel before, it may take you just to kind of the homepage of SciWheel. Let's see, log in or log out, which would look something like this, okay? Um, and so if you're on this screen and you've never created an account in SciWheel, go up to the sign in button at the very top right, do that, and then use your UT Tyler email um, and create your password. Now, I've already, you know, I've already created a, an account. I've been using it for some years now. So um, if you have any questions about actually creating your account, you know, or you'd like some one-on-one -on -one support with that in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or just anybody here in the library, and we're always very happy to help you with that. Now, let me go ahead and sign in again. <laughs> okay. So for those of you who may have just created your account, um, more than likely you are on the get started page. This is going to ask you things like, you know, what's your field of study? What do you mostly research? Things like that. The reason why SciWheel asks these questions is the more you use SciWheel and the more um, citations or references you save within the citation manager, it actually starts to kind of understand or get a better idea of what it is that you're researching. Um, and it will actually provide suggestions to you based on your research topic, um, which is pretty great. Um, I can definitely say that I've seen some of the suggested, you know, articles or book chapters, things like that. And they've actually been very helpful for my research topics in the past. Um, so, you know, when you have the time, it might benefit you to really go in and take a look and see how you can fill this out so it will make those recommendations for you. Um, one of the things that I always like to talk about from the get-go is that <clears throat> before you start, you know, uploading or saving or anything like that into uh, SciWheel, I like to point out these tools up here at the top. And so, I use these all the time because it makes my life a lot easier. You don't have to, but they are there and freely available to you um, as a subscriber and a user through UT Tyler. Um, so they have a Chrome, like a web browser extension. They have a Microsoft Word add-in, and they have a Google Docs add-in. 
Um, so whichever one of those you prefer to use. Um, I don't know of anybody who's ever told me they're using the Google Docs add-on because I think we're all pretty conditioned to using Microsoft Word when we're writing up our papers and things like that. But if you use Google Docs, they've got you covered. Um, and so the Chrome extension here is really, really fantastic. Um, and you'll see in my uh, Google Chrome account right up here at the top where my browser is, that's that Sidewell browser extension. Um, and it just shows up as a button up there once you install it. What this does though, um, is it turns any browser web page that you're on um, basically into a connected Sidewell um, link, if you will. So thinking about that um, Google Scholar uh, search that we did, which I should have left open, let's see. If we go back into Google Scholar, right? Um, so up here, we see my little SciWheel browser extension. Well, now it has a number 12 on top of it. And it's very tiny, um, but I promise it says number 12 up there. Um, and that's because SciWheel is registering that there are 12 resources on this page that it can um, automatically pull into your SciWheel account. And so when you click on the little browser extension button, it says 12 references found. And you'll see gender, women, and leadership. Well, that's the first one here. Um, and then the leadership challenge, the leadership challenge. So you see that it has actually picked up all 12 of the results on this page. You can actually go through and choose, you know, maybe you only want a select few of them. Or maybe you've browsed through all these and you realize these are fantastic and I need them for my literature review. So you can select all or just a few. Um, and then you see down here, add this article to a project. Well, really it means add these articles that you've selected. Um, and so in SciWheel, you get to organize your uh, references into projects. They can be public or private or let me say private or shared, let me say that. Um, and so when I click on this menu, I have a ton of projects. Um, so nobody judge my SciWheel account for being so big, <laughs> but I use it for personal use and I also use it for teaching. And so we see I have a lot of these private projects. These private projects, this means that only I have access to them. So only I can add or remove things or organize things or um, annotate things in these projects. And then we see, if I scroll down some more here, I have all of these shared projects. Now, this is the collaboration side of SciWheel. And so anybody who has an account with SciWheel can share a project with you. And so, um, you'll see I have like these down here. These are actually ones that I've used when working with um, graduate students. And I will create a shared project among all of us so that they can get in there and use it to practice much like, you know, just a sandbox really. Um, and you can certainly do that. Or what's fantastic is if you're working on any sort of research or maybe your literature review you're working with a colleague on, um, then you can invite them to this shared literature review project. And then you can both see, you know, what the other person has added, um, deleted, organized, included notes, you know, uploaded a PDF, you name it. You can see everything that they've done. So it really is very, very useful to have this Chrome extension because it takes a lot of that, you know, kind of monotonous copy, paste, typing, you know, uploading, all of that work that we normally do when we're, you know, working on a literature review. It's like, oh, this article looks great. I'm going to save it to my desktop and then I'm going to put it in the file and then I'm going to create the citation for it. And, you know, all this, stuff. this Chrome extension, it really saves you a lot of time, a lot of time, and it does the work for you. Um, and so, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave this here for now, and I'm going to jump back into my SciWheel account, and I'm going to go to my dashboard here. Um, 
Now my dashboard is where it's kind of like the home page. Once you get your account going and you start, you know, uploading or inputting references in there, you'll start seeing your dashboard populate. Um, and so if you want to see those individual references that you've created, go over here to your references tab. Now, again, my silo account is very large and a bit disorganized. I mean, it is organized, but also it's a bit not. So um, bear with me. Um, but you'll see I have almost 800 references saved uh, into my side wheel account. That's a lot. Um, now, this is just total, right? I don't have one project with 800 references in it. Um, <clears throat> now, over here in the left-hand column, we can see those private projects here, right? So we see those same ones that were in my list. And then we see those shared projects here. Um, so those are the same ones that show up whenever you use that Chrome extension. Um, and they also show up when you use the Microsoft Word extension, but we'll get to that in a moment. So let's say we wanted to create a new project just for today's workshop. So I am going to go, we'll create it as a private project for now. So that way, any of you who are following along right now can also do this. Um, and we'll just say, who are SSP test, um, Office of Research and Scholarship and Sponsored Programs test. And so I'm just going to click enter, right? And so we see it here now in my total list of private projects, but we also see there's nothing in it. Empty file folder, right? And that makes sense because we just created it. Now, what I can do is I'm going to just jump back over to that Google uh, Scholar search results. And then I'm going to go here. Now, I've already clicked these 12 references. So I'm just going to go back to that project list. And so now, oh, you know what? I need to refresh the page. Bear with me one moment. Okay, let's try this again. Select all, okay, back in that list, and we see ORSSP test right there. Um, and so I'm gonna click on that, and then I'm gonna click add. So we see it's spooling, it's working on it, it's got a lot of data to collect, right? And so we see all of those have now been moved and uploaded into my SciWheel account in that private project. Now. Just to prove it, right, I'm going to go back into the SciWheel account, hit refresh, and now we see that folder or that project is populated with all um, 11. I think that there was a duplicate on there. Honestly, I kind of glanced at that and I saw by title. Um, and so now we have all of these right here in our project. Easy peasy, right? And so when I click on one of these references, we see it's pulled some of the citation data, but not all the citation data for us, right? And that's okay because some is better than none. Um, we see the title, we see the author here, um, we see it was published through the um, University of Melbourne in Australia, and it was published in 2008. Now, we have the web link for this material, so I can go ahead and click on that, and it should open up in a new page. There we go. Okay. Um, and so here we have the information for that item. And we can actually go in and, you know, copy the abstract here if we wanted to, and then take it and put it over here in the field for the abstract. Additionally, if you have any notes, you know, let's say um, that you saved this uh, resource for a specific reason, right? Maybe because um, it's a uh, you know, based out of Australia, for instance. Um, so I can actually type that in, hit enter, and it saves, okay? Um, and so you can see this is just a private project. So that note is just for myself. However, if this had been a shared project, right, any of your collaborators in SciWheel would also be able to see that note. And everyone in that project could add notes or, you know, questions or anything, right? And so the capabilities here are pretty much endless. It can be very, very useful. Now, 
I'm going to go back and I'm actually going to show you, um, we're going to go out of this particular project for a moment. Um, and I'm going to go to one of my shared tests here. And I'm going to go um, into this. This is one that I worked with some um, PhD students on. This is just kind of our sandbox so they can play around and get comfortable with SciWheel. Now you see it is a shared project, right? And so I had uploaded, I think maybe about 10 articles through Google Scholar, like I just showed you. Um, but they have actually come in. There's been new activity since I visited this project. Um, so we can see all of the history here of things that people have done, right? And so we see who it is and we can actually click on it and go directly to where um, that uh, material or um, activity is. Now, if I go back to the references here, I'm gonna just click on this first one. Um, if it's the same one that I thought it was, I think it is. Yeah, we've done some work on here. So again, this is a journal article. We have the title, the authors, we have all of that publication information, right? So we have the journal, um, 15, 2015, sorry, um, volume 14, issue one, page range here, and the DOI, which is very good. No notes, we haven't added the abstract. However, um, there may be some related articles that go ahead and pop up here. So that's kind of what I was talking about. SciWheel does help you along. Um, so that's something to take note of. Now, over here on the right-hand side, um, we see open PDF, web link, and institutional access. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, this institutional access is because the library does have full text availability for this article. So if I were to click on that, it would take me to that library access point. Now, um, this web link is just like the web link that we used on the previous reference. It'll just take you straight to the web location of this article. We were able to find you know, the full text PDF of this article through the library's access. And so we actually uploaded that PDF file here. And so I'm gonna click open PDF and here we have it, okay? I know that often when people start using SciWheel, they have like a file folder or a dozen on their computer or personal device of PDFs that they've saved. Um, and what's great is that uh, SciWheel will actually allow you to batch upload a lot of those. Um, so we're gonna go over that in just a moment, but I wanted to show everybody what it looks like when a PDF is uploaded into SciWheel. Um, and so you'll see it's like a standard PDF display. Um, and we have all of our tools over here, like print, download, search, you know, things like that. Over here on the right side, though, this is all of our annotation tools for the PDF. And so this is really exciting because you'll see you can do highlighting in the document or highlighting and notes. And then there's actually drawing tools. And so let's say you're going through and you're reading this critically and you're working on a shared project and you just are really interested in um, drawing attention to certain things, right? Maybe an author or the keywords are very important. And so I can click on this little rectangle and I can, let's do green, green sounds good. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. Don't you know, it doesn't work for you when you need it to. I'm sorry, y'all. There we go. Goodness, that was difficult. So, I drew this really crude shape. So I'm gonna delete that, but um, let's say, there we go. I wanted to draw a green arrow. Just really great because once you do that, you have the functionality to really move it around. 
say I wanted to point to certain keywords or anything like that. You do have a pin, you have a text box, so you can, oof, you can draw text. Unless you're like me in which you accidentally click the wrong thing about six times in a row. <laughs> and so you can go in and edit any of your text. So that's really helpful when you are working on those collaboration projects, right? You can use this to um, annotate the PDF to highlight certain areas or paragraphs or authors or, you know, what have you. Um, and then when your collaborators actually come in, they can see all of these edits or all of these annotations that you have done as well. And so the PDF actually saves like this with these annotations on it. So let's say if you ever needed to maybe print it out for some reason um, or share it with a colleague outside of the project in Scilio, all of those annotations will save to the PDF file and you can share that um, annotated file with them. So at this point, I'm going to take us out of the PDF, keeping an eye on time. Um, I'm gonna go back to the standard Scilio account because I want to make sure that everybody kind of has an idea of the uh, interface, how it works. Um, like I mentioned before, you are able to import references that you already have. And so at the very top of your left-hand menu, there's an import references button. So they have all these different ways that you can import your references. Um, and it's extremely helpful because I know not everybody saves their references the same way, right? We all have our own systems. So like I said, I've had quite a few people come to me and they're like, well, I just have like a hundred different PDFs, you know, already on my personal device. And I'm like, that's fantastic. Um, Cyro will help you upload all of those. So if you save them in like Google Drive, Dropbox, or OneDrive, they give you those options here. If you save them on your actual device, you can choose this option. And you see when you choose that option, you can upload particular files or you can actually upload folders that have a bunch of files in them, right? Um, and so what's really great is you can upload a thousand PDFs at a time, or you can upload 100 files at a time. Um, so we're talking like large batch uploads, right? Uh, and it can be very time consuming to go in and have to do all of that individually. Now, when you do upload those, make sure that you double check after they've been uploaded into your Cyril account that um, all of that uh, citation or that publication data has come over as well. There are times when you do have to actually go in and manually edit a reference, um, right? That very first reference that we looked at did not actually have all that publication um, information, but it's very easy to edit that reference and add that information in. Same goes for any PDFs that you pull um, those references from like your Chrome extension or anywhere on the web. Um, not always does it bring the PDF file over, but that's a very simple, you know, download to your device and upload it to your SciReel account. You just want to double check those things. Now, let's say you've been using a different citation manager and you want to actually switch over to SciReel. Um, SciReel makes it pretty easy for you to do that. Um, they have those big three, like I like to call them, right? Um, citation managers, those most popular ones that people are probably already using. Um, and then EndNote as well as, well as any other um, citation managers. So it actually walks you through that process of how to transfer everything. And then the other really big one is that um, those identifiers, right? And so the biggest one right now, of course, is DOIs, those digital object identifiers. They're becoming more and more popular, thank goodness. Um, and they're, it's super easy to just use a DOI. You can actually um, paste multiple DOIs in here at a time or multiple PMIDs, or you can use just the URL, right? Let's say it's a website or maybe a book chapter and you just have the URL. You can absolutely do that paste it in here, click add, and then it will walk you through and maybe prompt you if there are any details that need to be um, updated or included that Cyril hasn't been able to actually um, pick up from the web. And for those of you who just like to, you know, have your hand on every part of the um, reference creation, they do have this create reference manually option. And so you can go in, 
I think the default is always journal article. It's the most popular, um, but you can see that there are many, many different options here. Um, PDF, patent, presentation, right? A thesis, a web page. So you can choose whichever is, um, you know, most appropriate for what you're uploading. And so then it just walks you through, it's literally just a form, any and all details that you have, you know, and it does require some, but we know, you know, when you create a reference or a citation, there is some material or some data that is required to have. So uh, no surprises there. And then once you hit add, it creates it for you, just like we've seen it do from the things that we um, brought over from Google Chrome. So. Can I yeah. ask a question? So I've been trying to follow along on my own. <laughs> and um, I did a Google search, but I can't figure out how you got the results into your site. Absolutely. So to do that, you have to have um, downloaded or uh, used the uh, Google Chrome extension. And so I already have it uploaded. Um, if you oh, don't have it, I use the Firefox extension. That's okay. Yeah, it should work just the same. Okay. Is it not working for you? Like not showing you the results of your search? Oh, the Google Scholar is, but I don't know how to get it into Skyrim. Okay. Um, so when you're looking at your search results, um, you should be seeing like a little number above oh, or on top of your Chrome extension. You know, it said when I uploaded it, here it is, but it really wasn't there. <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. the extension isn't there for some reason. Oh, okay. Um, let's let's talk after, and okay. I can walk you through that because um, I think I know what's happening there. And it's a it's a Google setting rather than a sidewheel thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm gonna go back into my references here. Um, that is a good pause point though. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns, or would you like me to repeat anything so far? Um, yeah, okay. Uh Christine is saying on chat, if you click on the puzzle piece right here on your Google Chrome, then um, that could potentially be where you find the uh, the extension. Christine, if you want to chat with her. Okay, I see that and it says go to, I can choose to go to Google Scholar, which I thought I did that, but then I still don't know. It's still not bringing it in for me. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and thank you, Annette, for uh, your comment. I saw uh, she said it was extremely helpful. So that's great. That's what I like to hear. Um, believe me, I could spend, I've spent more than an hour just talking about Google Scholar and kind of, not Google Scholar, Google Scholar on the brain, y'all. Um, Sciwheel. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with people individually talking about, you know, ways that Sciwheel can really help them on their projects and things like that. So I understand that this is probably information overload about how Sciwheel can help you and some of the benefits. I do apologize for that. It's a pretty fantastic tool that I'm trying to fit into a reasonable amount of time because I also want to give us time to talk about Scopus a bit. Um, so if you ever want to talk, you know, after today or after the session and just say, hey, I'd love a one-on-one -on -one or walk me through this again, you know, anything like that, please just let me know or let Kay know and she can, you know, connect us and I'd be more than happy to do that with you. Okay, so while people are maybe collecting their thoughts and questions, um, I am going to just show everybody, you know, let's say we go back into that new private project that I created for us today. And let's say it's all well and good. We've got all of these references in SciWheel, but how do we get them out and how can we use them, right? So the number one thing that people always tell me is they want to use a reference manager, they want to use SciWheel to easily create a works cited page for them or bibliography, right? And that's fantastic because it can do a lot of that work for you. 
Um, and so the way that you do that is you select, there's, well, there's multiple ways to do it, but one of the easiest ones is you can select the references that you're wanting to create citations for. Now, doesn't have to be everyone in your folder or in you know, your SciWheel account, but since there's only 11 in our private project for today, I'm just gonna go ahead and select all there. And then you come over to this little icon. It's just a arrow inside of a rectangle or a square. Um, so click on that. And that actually gives us a pretty long um, menu here. Now we see that we can move these references, say into a new project or a different project. We can also copy them to a different project. Um, we can export them, which is a really fantastic tool. Maybe you wanna send them to someone in like an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. You can download all the PDFs for the references that you've selected. You can email the references to somebody. Um, SciWheel does have a reading list. Um, and so those are the ones uh, you create your reading list or you build your reading list to know which references you need to go back and actually read. Um, you can remove them from reading list and then generate bibliography. Now that's what we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna generate that bibliography. And so you'll see here, I, because I've already used SciWheel for a while, right? It has set to my preference, which is APA. Um, and that's seventh edition right now. Since 2019, we've been on the seventh edition. Now, let's say the APA is not the uh, style that you want to use. Just use this drop down menu. And then this is an extremely long list of styles. Um, as a librarian, I am always baffled by this list. Uh, you think you know the majority of the citation styles out there, not even close. Um, and so whatever your style may be, right? Like let's say you use um, Chicago. So I just go ahead and click or type Chicago. And then we also see just for the 17th edition, there are many options. So you get to choose which one is most appropriate for you, or maybe which one is most appropriate in matching uh, the journal that you're about to be published in or whatever style your book is requiring, you know what I'm talking about. So you get to choose um, whatever works for you. I'm going to stick with mine for the APA 7th edition, and it does give us, you know, kind of a example here. So we can make sure, yes, this is the style that we want. And so I'm going to go ahead and click generate. Now it's working. And we see that it just automatically downloaded over here. So I click on that. Now, this is simply an HTML file, which just means it's just text, right? It's nothing fancy. Um, it doesn't format at all 100%. However, all of the data that was available in those references is, you know, put in the correct order um, and format, right? We see things in italics and parentheses and things like that for the citation um, style that you selected. So we can easily go from here and copy or select all and then hit copy. And then we can go into, for instance, a Word document and just hit paste and it's all right there for you. Um, so that is one way um, to generate a bibliography or works cited here in SciWheel. And it does all that work for you. Now, there is another way, and that is using that Microsoft Word extension. And so again, under your tools drop down menu, we have the Word add-in, okay? And so if you're thinking about using the Word add-in, I recommend like going through and taking a look at some of the things that it will do for you. They give you a guide here to kind of walk you through. Um, it's a fantastic tool. If you use Microsoft Word at all, right, to do any of your scholarly writing, I highly recommend um, downloading the Microsoft add-in if you're going to be using SciWheel because it allows you to essentially use the SciWheel tool within Microsoft Word to pull references straight from your SciWheel account in real time. And then it will generate that bibliography or generate those in-text citations for you in real time and make sure that they are um, linked 
formatted, you name it, it will do it properly for you in real time. So <clears throat> footnotes, in notes, anything. Um, and so it really can save you a lot of time. So essentially, Silo can be a lot of work at the front end, right? When you get your Silo account going, there's the importing of your references, there's the you know Chrome extension, kind of getting the lay of the land. But when you start to really pull those resources together, um, it's going to save you a lot of time and make the process for you a lot easier. So that's Cywheel in a nutshell, more or less, <laughs> a 45 minute nutshell. Like I said, we could talk a lot longer and I'm happy to do that individually if you'd like. Does anybody have any questions before I move us over to Scopus? I have one question, Sarah. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned about the PDF of those, those references. Uh -huh. So is this PDF is restricted if the like the like me library has uh, access to it or not? For example, some libraries here, a lot of uh, journal PDF you cannot get it. So you have to like get from other like uh, places, some other university. So in, if you have this account, so you can get all the PDF if it's available or. So, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, um, mm -hmm. but I think I understand your question about, <laughs> you know, the, we won't say the legality of, yeah, the, yeah. of the PDFs, but, you know, just kind of the, uh, you know, where it comes from and where the, where the line is, right? Uh -huh. um, so, essentially, if uh, you scan the web for the PDF, for instance, with Google Scholar, um, and you find it, you download that PDF or upload that PDF to SciWheel, that file is in there and it shouldn't go anywhere because the file is uh, separate in a way. Uh -huh. um, now, if you get it from the library, you know, either library or maybe interlibrary loan where we borrow mm -hmm. it from another institution, right? So even then, um, if you have that interlibrary loan access, right, um, you should be able to download a PDF uh -huh. copy of that um, mm -hmm. document or journal or whatever. Um, and then once you have that individual PDF file, that is yours. And oh, okay. so you upload that into SciWheel and it should stay there, no problem. Okay. And another question is that this account is a, is a free to, to faculty members for UT Tyler or you have to, you have to pay excuse me, it's free. Um, the library, uh, we subscribe to SciWheel. Uh, okay. And so, uh, yeah. And so we pay okay. that subscription fee much like a database. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Sarah, is the SciWheel available uh, to the Health Science Center library as well? That is a fantastic question. Um, Christine, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that they have access to it. I am not 100%, but you can be. set up the free account. Mm -hmm. They won't have as many projects that you can set up. Um, let me see if I can get Michael real quick and find out for you. Okay, thank so, you. So we're yes, trying to have an like, email account from UT Tyler for Health Campus. So we can use that email. Maybe it should be free or available for, for us too, right? Uh, yeah, and especially with time. this, yeah, especially with the new transition for the emails, yeah. that's why I was thinking, you know, we should all, everybody should have access to yeah. it, but okay. um, thank you, Christine, for double checking on that, um, and if you want to just uh, unmute whenever you have more information and, and chime in, because um, that's definitely something that we all need to know. Any other questions about SciWheel? So one thing I, I maybe I missed. So like you are showing now, so like a word document and trying to like. So I didn't see how do, how do we like uh, like in the EndNote. We, I use EndNote, so it's all like cite while you're writing. So you write and then you put, put it in. Mm -hmm. So in this same as the EndNote. So you how do you insert the reference sure. to the document? Yeah, absolutely. So to do that, you would need to download this Word, this Microsoft Word add-in. 
And mm. then um, once you have that word atom, let me see. It will look like this in your Microsoft Word account. Can everybody see my Microsoft Word page? Because I did switch browse, like I switched screens. No. Okay. No, you didn't Thank you for that. I will reshare. Okay. How about now? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and so once you download that Microsoft Word um, Sywheel add-in, it will look like this. And it's not very pretty, but you have Sywheel here. And of course, mine needs to be updated because why not? Um, but it's going to take oh, a minute and do all that. Okay. Let's see. Oh, it's like there we go. And so um, I haven't used it now with this updated version, but when you click on the side wheel over there in the far left, it will bring up. Oh. I'm sorry, y'all. I should have double checked on this. Um, but just to just to keep an eye on the time, let me go back. Let me go back to. When it's updated right in your Microsoft Word account and you sign into your account, it's going to look like this right here in the screenshot that they have. And so you can go in and actually insert those citations, just like you were talking about with EndNote. Um, and you can actually go in and search. There's a search feature in your Microsoft Word account for SciWheel that is directly linked to your SciWheel account. So as you search for maybe an author um, or the title or something like that, um, it will pull that information and you see it will show up right here in your search results and you can click cite and it will immediately add in that updated citation or in-text citation in your document. And the same way kind of works for bibliography, but there's a lot more features as well. This is a very simplified overview of the word add-in. Um, but to answer your question, yes, it does work oh, that yeah. same way. Thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else? These are all great questions. Okay. I know that we're coming up to an hour um, and that, you know, I'm here for as long as y'all need me. I understand if people have things to do at the three o'clock mark, um, but I am going to switch us over to Scopus um, and I'll try to do, uh, you know, a pretty concise, um, efficient overview of Scopus. But I just want to make sure that everybody sees Scopus and has an understanding of how it works. Um, so that way, when you start to use it for your own literature reviews, um, you can you can really get into those powerful tools. Um, settings. Okay. So if you remember way back at the beginning of all this, um, we went to the library's databases by title and to the letter S. And so I'm going to scroll down here again, and I'm going to go until we see Scopus, which is ironically right underneath SciWheel. So if I click on that, um, it's going to open up Scopus for me, and it looks like this. If you're off campus, you'll have to log in with your Patriots credentials. Um, or your beauty Tyler credentials. Um, and now remember for anybody um, on the health sciences campus, uh, the database uh, web of science will be your um, comparable alternative, right? So instead of Scopus, you'll be using web of science. Now, the thing to remember about Scopus and web of science, they're not um, what we consider like a standard database. These are what we call bibliographic databases. So you're not going to be able to get um, any sort of full text or those full text PDFs in Scopus or Web of Science. However, a really great way to think about these databases is more like a giant index and also a really great networking feature or tool. Um, and so let's say you are starting off on a topic for your literature review and you're just not having a lot of luck um, or maybe you know that there's literature out there on a topic but you're having a hard time finding it or finding any references to it you know or things like that that's when scopus and web of science can really be helpful 
Um, and so we see here, you have your drop down menu where you tell the database um, the search terms that you use, what are they? Is it going to be an author name? Is it going to be an article title? Um, you know, where do you want to search for your terms or terminology? Now, the uh, standard is article title, abstract, and keywords. So that's a fairly broad search that Scopus does for us. I'm just going to leave it as is. Um, you can search directly for authors, and to do that, I recommend going into this authors tab. It can be a lot more um, concise, and so it can just really be efficient for you. But let's say we're looking more at a topic or more broadly at the literature. I'm going to go into search documents, and instead of my standard leadership example topic, I'm actually going to do um, COVID-19 because it is so very prominent and relevant. So if you'll notice, I just did COVID-19. I didn't do coronavirus. I didn't do you know anything like that. We can always go in and add those if we wanted to, um, or we could you know do a more specific search. But I'm interested just to see like what what is out there right now. So. <clears throat> Like any other standard database, right? We have our search results here. Um, and you'll see some of the standard things that you see in any search results, even in Google Scholar, right? So we have the title of the material, we have the authors, we have the publication, so Journal of Environmental Sciences, we have the publication year, um, volume or issue number, and then the page range. So all of that you can find pretty much anywhere. Um, but we also have other options. Um, so we can look at the abstract here, just like any other database. Um, now, something uh, excuse that's... Me. Yes. So how does that year become 2024? Right. <laughs> it's a, it's a pre-publication. So early. Uh, yes. More than Oh. Yes, and that's why I always recommend, you know, looking in Scopus and Web of Science because they will show you these pre-publications oh. long before, say, a, a journal web, a journal's website will. Um, and so it's it's really neat um, how you can kind of build build your literature review using these tools. <clears throat> um, so one thing to kind of keep in mind is that um, while you cannot get full text access within Scopus or Web of Science, there are these buttons. They look really strange. They say SFX. Um, if you hover over it, it says get it. And so what this does, if I click on this, it will scan to see if the library has access to it. Okay. Now, this is a pre-publication, right, published in 2024. Um, so we do actually, it looks like we have that pre-pub version here in Science Direct. You can view the PDF here. So we do have access to this. Now, not all um, results are going to be this way uh, in Scopus or Web of Science. Um, we got lucky with this one. So sometimes whenever you click that SFX button, it doesn't come up and that's okay. Um, that's when you want to check the Google Scholar. And then if you can't find it on Google Scholar, that's when you want to use interlibrary loan. One way or another though, we can get you access to that article or resource if it's not an article. So looking further um, at this result, one of the things that I always like to point out is the citations. So, this citations is actually, it's not the number of citations within the document. It's um, the number of times that this resource has been cited by others. Okay. Now, with all of these being published in 2024, it's no surprise that they haven't been cited by others um, as pre-publications. So what we can actually do is come over here and let's say we just want to look at the period from 2019 to 2021. Let's see what the literature looked like just in that two-year period on COVID-19. 
Okay, so still have a ton of literature out there, lots and lots of resources. Now you'll notice it's sorted by um, newest to oldest. Um, sorry, I'm seeing that all of the citations are listed as zero and that's, I think Scopus is having a moment. Um, regardless, um, we can see here, <clears throat> over here in our left-hand column, where we would call this like our filters or our limiters. Um, you can see the subject area that most of the literature is published in. No surprise that the majority of these results are coming out of the field of medicine. Um, and we can actually limit and just look at the field of medicine's results if we wanted to. You can look at the document type, right? So if you're just interested in conference papers or you're just in interested in articles, you can do that. Languages. Um, and then keywords that are listed. So if we're not just looking at COVID-19, but we also want to look at the number of times pandemic was listed, you can do that as well. And then there are a ton of other filters that you can use. And I'm not going to go through every single one of them, um, but I do want to show some important ones, right? So author name is something that could be very valuable for a literature review. If you have a prominent author or authors in the field, um, you want to make note of that and see what else they're publishing or have published. Um, and so you can do that here. So we see we've got two authors here that are over 250 um, uh, works each. Um, and so if I wanted to just look at their individual works in the search results, you could do that. Um, <clears throat> so that's something to keep in mind. The other is funding sponsor, especially um, since this is for the Office of Research and Scholarship and Sponsored Programs, it's important to make note of those funding sponsors because that could directly um, you know, influence the literature review, it could directly influence maybe your future uh, search for funding, you know, on any sort of, um, you know, uh, research project or anything like that. Also, it's just really interesting to kind of see, you know, for a different topic, where is the majority of the funding coming from? No surprise here that we're looking at the NIH as, you know, the biggest funder for the COVID-19 literature that we're seeing here, but with a different topic, who knows what it could be. Um, and in case you're interested, the affiliation of the authors is sometimes very helpful. All kind of depends on how you are approaching your literature review. Um, but like I said, there's a bunch of different uh, filters here. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind, play around with, see what you find. Um, now, if we're looking back, just kind of thinking of our entire um, list of results, sometimes it helps, especially when we're looking at like 251,000, you know, search results. This is not something, you know, that you would necessarily leave at this high number whenever you're doing a literature review, right? If you're working on a topic for literature review, it's a lot more specific than COVID-19. And I realize that. Um, but just using this as an example, Sometimes it helps, I know it helps me to get more of a visual um, idea or, you know, kind of concept of what I'm looking at. And so you can do that in um, Scopus by clicking this analyze results. Um, in Web of Science, I forget what it's called, but there is a feature where you can do that. And I think it's located at the very bottom of your um, filters column on the left. Um, but in Scopus, we're going to do analyze results. It's taking a minute. Okay. And so this just gives us different ways to analyze our search results, right? And so we see the documents by year. Okay. And so again, no surprise, we had 67 documents in Scopus on COVID-19. Honestly, I expected that number to be a lot lower for 2019. However, in 2020, it jumps up by a lot. No surprise there. And then of course, in 2021, that number doubles. And so we can see, you know, 
if you're looking at um, a more specific topic, a topic in a different field, you know, if you're really trying to get an idea of what the literature looks like, what is that field looking like? Is it something that, you know, people aren't really studying right now? Um, is it in its heyday right now and everybody's studying it, but five years ago they didn't, you know, I mean, these kinds of, you know, understandings really can help you develop your literature review. Um, and so this is just the documents by year. Um, we also have per year by source. Okay. And so that's looking at, you know, those um, uh, journal publications, you know, where's it coming from, things like that. Again, we have by author and um, authors are really important when it comes to doing the literature review. We like to know um, who those key authors and researchers are on a topic. Documents by affiliation, um, by country or territory, the type of document. So are we looking at conference proceedings? Are we looking at, um, <clears throat> are we looking at like editorial articles, book chapters, things like that, subject area, Again, even just looking at this little snapshot, we can see that the majority is in medicine, no surprise there. And then documents by funding sponsor. So again, that's where we're talking about that NIH and um, so on. And so if we wanted to go to maybe documents by subject area, we can click on that tile. And so we see over here, this is the list view and this is the graphic view, right? And so you can actually click on these. It is interactive, and so you can go in and say, I want to look at maybe the ones published in psychology. Um, thank you, Karen. Uh, and so I can click on that, and it will actually update our Scopus list just to show us those that were published within that subject that we chose. Um, and so <clears throat> 9,000 of that 251,000 plus, you know, list is just in psychology. And then we can go from there. We see that it's limited to psychology. We can go down here and look at the author's name and we see the top players just in psychology on the COVID-19 topic. Um, so there are a lot of ways in Scopus that you can play around with and I don't want to say manipulate, but essentially you are manipulating your search results so that you can get a better um, view of the entire literature field. Um, and so this is just the analyzed search results, right? And so it's fun to play around with, but it's also extremely helpful. Um, if you're like me, a very visual learner that analyze search results, it can really come in handy. Now, some of the other great features about Scopus, this sort by, you don't have to sort it by the most recent date, right? If we wanna uh, sort by relevance, or if we wanna sort by um, the highest cited, right? So we see here that within the 2019 to 2021 time period, um, this article uh, was cited almost 28,000 times. That's significant, right? And so that's just within a two-year time period um, on a very broad subject. But when you start digging into your own um, research topics and things like that, you know, this citations is going to be very, very valuable. Citations column, I should say. Um, and so that's just sorted by uh, cited. We can, you know, source title, author, you name it. You have lots of options in Scopus. So um, I, yeah. yeah. I have one more question. Sure. Sometimes I have a problem with finding authors, uh, especially the Chinese authors. Uh, they like a lot of similar last name and then the, the first initial mm -hmm. name. So when I search, I get like thousands of papers actually that person I'm looking for doesn't publish that many. So is there a way how to, that's also applied to other authors from other country too? Absolutely. Yeah, and like, um, yeah. thank you for asking that question because it's a perfect segue into the next thing that I was going to talk about. Um, and so one of the, one of my favorite features in Scopus is the author profiles. And so you're absolutely right. Um, we get a lot of 
similar names or, you know, similarly spelled names, or um, this is especially common with female researchers. If they decide to change their name at any point in time due to marriage or not, or whatever, you know, sometimes there's different variations of their names listed, you know, in different time periods of their research. So what I recommend doing, especially in this case, um, is actually searching for, uh, locate an article in Scopus or Web of Science um, that you know is authored by the author you're looking for, right? Regardless of if there's like 12,000 of those authors' names, you know, listed in Scopus, find that article that you know is published by the author you're looking for, and then come over here and click on that author's name. And so when I do that, <clears throat> it's going to take us to the author profile. Okay, and so we see here, we have their name and we have their affiliation if it's if it's linked here, right? Um, this is their Scopus ID number. Um, if they had an ORCID ID, um, then they could input here. Um, not everybody does, and even those who do don't necessarily connect their Scopus with their ORCID ID, but you can do that. Um, and so, fun fact, if you have published, um, there's a pretty good chance that your name is actually in Scopus, right? Some of your research mm -hmm. may be in Scopus. So just as a fun exercise, you should search for yourself, just see if it's out there. Um, if you do find yourself, you can actually claim your own author profile so that way you can go in and make edits and update your author profile, right? With the, the most current or the most um, correct information. Not everybody does that, um, but based on what Scopus provides us with this author, we see um, <clears throat> that they've been cited by over 40,000 different documents. Um, they've had 430 co-authors. Um, they have a high age index. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, so what we can do is actually see. But this, this age index is very low. It's 14. It should be more. Did I say hi? I'm sorry. No, there used to be like 50 or something, like like 47,000 citations, 430 papers, maybe should have a lot of very high age index. Yes. But this, I, I was come up with 14. <laughs> I was on a roll and, you know, in my mind, I was just like H index yeah, yeah, and okay. here we go. Yeah. But thank okay. you for pointing that out. <laughs> um, but uh, as we continue down the author profile, we can see document and citation trends. So again, this is kind of one of those things that's very important to look at. You know, when were they most productive, right? Especially if it's on a particular topic, maybe the entire field is what they specialize in. Maybe they, um, you know, uh, founded the research field, you know, or something like that. You know, that's very important. And you can take a look here and see kind of what has their research um, timeline looked like? Um, most contributed topics for the period that they have been here in Scopus. And so we see those, we can view all topics. We can look at a citation overview and analyze the author's output. But what's really interesting is if we get down here and we look at all of the documents that are available, in, or I should not say available, that are indexed in Scopus, um, for this author are listed here. We see the topics associated with the author, um, the co-authors listed, and any awarded grants um, would be listed here as well. And so you can see, again, the search results are listed date newest to oldest, but let's look at cited the highest, right? And so we see that, that same one, the one that we clicked from, almost 28,000 citations, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and so we see he is pretty heavily cited um, and we can go on to see, you know, kind of how it drops off. Um, but these of course are going to be just this author. I say all that to say these author profiles can really help you um, kind of connect the dots in your literature review. It can really help you get a snapshot of the prominent authors, the prominent players on your search topic and help you determine, you know, maybe if you're kind of hitting that wall 
in the literature search process and you're like, I can't find any more literature out there regarding my topic, maybe it's time to take a look at what your authors or your prominent authors have actually produced over their career and see maybe that's how you start picking back up on that literature search, um, you know, or who is citing these articles that are prominent in your research topic. And so if we wanted to look at, you know, who has cited this top article, right, then we can click on this number over here. And so now we see 27,952 documents have cited this article, and we see all of those um, citing sources listed here. And so again, we don't have to look at them in publication date order, right? We can look at them who's cited their citations, you know, who's, it, it starts to snowball on itself, right? But Scopus can be very, very, very valuable for you, especially um, if you're kind of hitting that wall or you're trying to expand your literature review, but you're not necessarily sure which direction or, you know, things like that. There's a lot of potential with these tools, Scopus and Web of Science.